Hi, Peter Lindemann here of Lindemann Associates and other affiliated entities. It's the afternoon of April 2nd, and I'm just putting down some of my thoughts uh, about what has happened since the last time I did one of these about a week ago, and I'll continue putting out little ones. They help me think things through, and I hope they help you see things a little more clearly. As I had expected, we saw the jump in unemployment insurance claims uh, today announced for eight days, the week that ended eight days ago. And that number was around 6.6 .6 million. Three weeks earlier, it was 210,000. That means that as of Wednesday, last week, we had lost about 10 million jobs in a period of two weeks. And I suspect that as we sit here today on April 2nd, in the intervening week, we've lost another 10 million. And that would mean we've lost 20 million jobs in three weeks. Uh, how many jobs did we start with? We started with about 157 million jobs, and we've now lost 20 million of those. So the number of people working is down from about 157 million down to about 137 million. And the number of unemployed is up from about 5 million to probably about 25 million as we sit here. Um, that means that the unemployment rate as we sit here is probably on the order of about 16%. To put that in context, during the financial crisis, the peak unemployment rate was about 10.3%, and the peak unemployment rate other than during the Great Depression was 10.8% in 1982's recession. So we're already time and a half the unemployment rates that we recorded um, in the two worst recessions since the Great Depression. And that's a staggering number because if you go back to the end of the first week in March, it was 3.5% with 5 million people out of a 162 million person labor force unemployed. This means that you're living in the worst period of unemployment in the United States history of basically everybody's adult experience. There are some people who were alive during the Great Depression, um, but most of them were children or teenagers at that time. So we are, to say we're living in unique times is an understatement. I estimate that we are also losing about 10 basis points of GDP every day that we remain shut down. Another way of saying that is every week we lose about 70 basis points of GDP. That is a cost of about 20 Point five billion dollars a day while we're shut down. Um, and that's a pretty staggering number. That means that since we've been shut down for, um, while we've been shut down, we have shed in three weeks uh, about 2.1% of the economy. Um, and it means 
really by the end of this week will have shed about 2.8% of the economy, minus 2.8% of the economy. That would be the second or third largest decline in GDP since the Great Recession, Great, Great Depression, with basically 1982 and the financial crisis being modestly higher, but those took 9, 10, 12 months to occur. This all occurred overnight. I was speaking to someone the other day and I said, what do you, you shouldn't be shocked at this. This is exactly what I feared would happen the minute countries and states started shutting down economies. And they're shutting down 40, 50, 30 percent of the economy. I said, imagine that ISIS took control of the country or countries and they did it without a war. Um, and what that amounts to is that um, what do you think ISIS would do if they took over? Well, they'd shut down essentially all travel. They'd set down all fun. They'd shop, set down most of retail uh, experiences, except perhaps buying burkas. Um, they certainly shut down entertainment, and the new entertainment would become beheadings. Uh, they would greatly restrict citizen movement in every way and citizen gatherings um, except to pray. And basically, that's what we've done voluntarily to our economies. Whether that's right or wrong, history will sort out. But that's what we've done to our economies, except we did it with no religious motivation. So we didn't have burqas, prayers, and beheadings. But when you just objectively say, if you shut down your economy, uh, you're going to have big fallout, not a surprise. I think what's going to happen in the next week is you're going to see another probably five to 10 million more unemployed, and you're going to see another 70 basis points drop in GDP. And people say, well, what about the various government programs? They are being talked about, but they haven't, and they've been passed, but they have not been effectuated. So I know many of you are trying to get these small business loans that you've heard about. And the application comes out tomorrow. And I'm sure they're trying to work expeditiously. I'm sure they're going to be overwhelmed. But it, the cavalry is coming. But in the meantime, lots of jobs are shed and lots of companies are being hurt. The infrastructure of our economy I don't mean roads and sewers. I mean the real infrastructure of our economy, like entrepreneurs running companies, uh, people uh, working and having great work habits, etc. Every day that goes by, that's being frayed. Um, it's like if you have a, um, a machine sitting idle, it doesn't improve. Um, infrastructure needs to be utilized. So. My guess is that even with the SBA and other actions taken, that you're going to see the unemployment rate get to 25% within about three more weeks. And I think you're going, could go as high as 35% by the end of April. Some of the programs that are reduced Yes, they encourage you to keep employees, particularly if they're earning less than 100000 But also the programs that improve unemployment payments um, encourage you to furlough people. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Even if you keep people on the payroll, let's not kid ourselves. 
they're not employed. They're not producing. So we would still have the 70 basis point drop in GDP because we're not producing anything. We're not doing anything, just paying people. You can't do pay people forever to do nothing. Uh, measured GDP might be slightly higher, but the real output, the real productivity of our economy is going to fall about 70 basis points a week while we're shut down. Um, by the way, that means if we're shut down for seven weeks, which would pretty much be the end of April, we will have lost 5% of GDP, which would be the largest decline in GDP uh, other than, again, during the Great Depression. So this is a very serious situation. I would also say that one of the things that I find most unnerving is that in May and June, you have a lot of high school students graduating. You have a lot of college students graduating. You have a lot of junior college students graduating. And basically, the availability of jobs is very low, even in sectors that have not been shut down. And that's because so much work is being done remotely. So many firms are closed, even though they're operating that um, it's very difficult to hire somebody virtually. And so what I really worry about is the class of 2020, high school, college class of 2020, is going to come out and find no jobs available and no infrastructure, economic infrastructure there to embrace them and bring them into the economy. And that is long-term dangerous, and in short-term, very dangerous from a social unrest perspective. Um, you're seeing little snippets around the world of social unrest, and it's hard to know what it's really being driven by. But certainly, unemployment rates of 25-30% and a huge graduating class coming out with no prospects to speak of is not an appetizing thought. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, I'll step back and the 2nd of April means that we've had at least a day of apartment rent collections. And while this is hardly scientific, the handful of apartment companies that I've spoken to say that on the first day, their collections are not much different than a month earlier. And I think that would be very good news. However, it remains to be seen if that holds true through the first five days. And it also remains to be seen if it carries over into May. As to commercial rents, spottier, much spottier. And there's a number of firms who are reporting they're just not going to pay. Some of them are big name firms, uh, many small firms. I repeat my concern that many small and mid-sized type of companies, I think, are not going to open. The restaurant, the hair salon, the nail salon, etc., because many of them are owned by people in their 60s or above who were already thinking about not coming back, uh, not, you know, about retiring, I should say. And the notion of coming back into what at best will be a difficult economic year and could be a very difficult economic year where they bleed money and further would reduce their uh, nest egg and the brain damage is just not very appetizing. And yes, as I've said before, they'll be replaced eventually by new firms. But in the meantime, there's no firm there to hire the new people coming out. And that's what I mean by the, the network, the, uh, the infrastructure of the economy fraying. 
I think retail rent collections could be very ugly. I think office collection less so. On thinking about offices over the last week, we all know that not only was WeWork an other co-working tenancy, the darling of the day in terms of uh, short-term leases, tightly packed people, uh, hot seating, work areas, put on your headphones and and, and you know, I've always found that strange, which is they're to encourage co-working and yet you isolate and um, with headphones and all the cognitive literature shows that distractions are very destructive to productivity. We've written about that in the past in Lineman letter a number of times. But not only we work and other co-work tenants, but a lot of corporate tenants, traditional corporate tenants, you go into their newly leased space of a year ago, six months ago, and they're proud of, they've laid out open space, hot seat, no one has an office, you just grab a table, a seat at the table, butcher block type of tables, tightly packed. And yes, you do reduce your rent by doing that. And it, quote, looks cool. But then I've never been a cool person, so I don't fully appreciate its coolness. But the problem has always been in my mind, the productivity, the cognitive research part shows productivity goes down with that kind of space. But I think that's dead. That kind of space is going to be dead. You talk about fundamental changes. I think a lot of the tenants who put a lot of money into fitting out butcher block, hot seat, uh, highly interactive, sitting a foot away from coworkers, you don't have your own space. I think you're going to see a lot of them go back rather quickly to what I would call more traditional carols and offices. Namely, uh, unless there's a vaccine pretty quickly, which is highly unlikely, I, I'm going to have concerns about your sanitation standards, who's been there. I want to be a f three feet, four feet minimum, maybe six, seven feet from a coworker. You can't do that in that kind of layout. It's designed for the exact opposite. And so I think that's a that's a that's a office style that is in dramatic trouble. For the hotel sector, they have my prayers. Um, they've been essentially put out of business by both a serious contagious disease and as if that wouldn't have been difficult enough on them, they were basically shut down by government action. And again, you can argue if that's good or bad, if it was the right policy or not. It's basically been a policy that for certain sectors is worse than the Great Depression. At least in the Great Depression, hotels had some occupancy. In this, they basically have no occupancy, and that's by mandate. Um, I think we are probably going to be fast approaching the point where we've got to consider not only are we saving lives and how many lives with very imperfect data in very real time, but that there are other things that are important, namely people having an enjoyable life, people having the ability to interact with their friends and family, people having the ability to be productive, people having the ability to move around. And yes, that's going to involve risk, but we've always lived with risk. We have never lived in a riskless society. And in fact, most of our history, we've lived with highly infectious and highly deadly diseases, smallpox, polio. I mean, people point out Boris Johnson's situation, but we've had president of the United States, FDR, who sat in office with polio. 
Uh, yes, he didn't get it while he was in office, but many, many other Americans got it while he was in office. We've had measles and mumps many of us grew up with and small a chicken pox and all these horrible things, hep C. So we learn how to deal with stuff and we learn how to attack it. We learn how to live with it, work with it, play with it, travel with it, entertain with it. And that's the real challenge I think that we face is how do we do that? We have to open the economy back up. We have to allow medicine to do what medicine can do, which I think is quite amazing. I fully expect pretty effective treatments in a fairly near term. I'm less optimistic about vaccines in the very near term, but pretty effective treatments. And we have to remember what happens if it takes 20 years to find a vaccine. We can't shut down the economy for 20 years waiting for a vaccine to come. That would just be ridiculous. We are to the point where we have to salvage the economy. Uh, we have to make difficult trade-offs. We have two curves we have to think about flattening. One is the loss of lives and the other is the destruction of the economy and of lives. People are going to suffer from depression, mental illness, alcoholism, drug abuse, familial abuse. Uh, all of these are going to go up and there's the lurking social unrest issue, particularly as the class of 2020 graduates and shortly thereafter. We have to really understand that we live in a difficult and complicated world at all times. There's never a free time in our life. Work will look somewhat different. Travel will look somewhat different. Play will look somewhat different. Shopping will look somewhat different. Much as the experience of going through an airport looks somewat different after terrorist uh, uh, activity. But we, we can move on from this. The longer we wait, the more damage to the economic infrastructure, the longer the recovery takes. Those of you who have known me for any amount of time know I'm one of the most optimistic, I like to believe realistic people out there. I think generally we overreact to the good and we overreact to the bad. I think we're very much in an overreact to the bad scenario. It's hard to believe that the future value of all these companies is a f down 30 to 50 percent from what they were uh, a matter of weeks ago. This will pass and we'll have brighter times again, but it'll take us a year or so to get back to them. And the longer we wait, the longer it's going to take. Um, I certainly don't have the answers. All I'm trying to do is what I've always tried to do, which is let you know what I'm thinking, let you know clearly why I think it, and you're smart people, and it's designed to help you think through your own situations and your own thoughts, rather than be a guru on the mountain that has the right answer. If you would like to keep in touch with what we're doing, I will do more of these probably about once a week. We also do some postings. You can reach out to my brother Doug at D Linneman, L I N N E M A N, at linemanassociates.com. D Linneman at linemanassociates.com. And he will happily tell you how to stay in touch with us. And also, if you're interested in Linneman Letter or any of the other products we do, feel free to reach out to him. The new Linneman Letter just came out uh, yesterday, um, full of what I think and why and speculations and where we were. Um, and we do that quarterly. And again, it's to try to stimulate your thinking more than just to provide answers. Having said that, Stay safe, stay smart, and hopefully uh, stay productive. Thank you.